and then we can get started. So this is our third, no, second? It's our second week, right, with our Push to Diamond group. Um, and this week's topic was time management, and uh, hopefully everybody is caught up on their videos. Uh, so I will let Mark uh, take it away. You guys all know Mark. I hope so. I hope so. I know a lot of you guys probably don't know me, um, but uh, I hope that this week has at least been a little bit helpful when it comes to time management and some of the different tips that I gave you, um, as well as my wife. And she did walk back in, so she's going to be on the call. Um, today, well, actually, when we first started this, uh, Greg asked me to speak to you guys in regards to vision. And uh, Jason and Greg both knocked that out of the park last week. So I'm not going to go over exactly what they went. I'm going to give you guys a little bit different of a twist when it comes to your why and your vision, because I get questions about it all the time. Um, and I've actually just finished uh, Simon Sinek's uh, Start With Why. So I realize how important and how powerful it is, but I still get questions about it all the time. So I want to, I want to basically clear a few things up for you guys. Now, starting off with your why. So there's, there's your personal why, which is, personal to you. It's something that you're going to be working for. And it's not necessarily something that everybody else is going to be enjoying or, you know, being, you know, pushing the envelope and doing well for, um, because everybody else is going to have their own personal why. And so it's important to figure out what those personal whys are. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know the four questions that I kind of ask people um, to get that personal why out. But we also have our, the, the why of like our business and our company. And that is a why that we all kind of share. And I'll actually go over that um, a little bit in, into detail a little later because that's more of a why that Carl has created for us. Um, it's kind of the reason why we're doing so well as a business, as a company. And, um, and we'll go into that in a little bit more uh, detail in a minute. But I want to explain to you how I get people to... Um, tell me what their why is. There's really four questions. And this was actually on one of the uh, wake up calls. And this has really been helpful for me. Um, and I use this for my challengers. And I also use it for my coaches. Because if you can find out their why, obviously, you can, you can really dig deep. And when you initially ask somebody what their why is, usually it's, it's kind of just skin deep. So this is the question that I ask them. First, I ask them for their specific goals you know, what specifically are they, they looking to lose? Or like, let's say if they're trying to lose weight, how much weight? Um, if they're looking to become a coach, you know, why? Uh, or uh, what is their specific goals when it comes to being a coach? And I ask them why. And this initial question, you know, the, the specifics as far as their goals and the why kind of skin deep. And people will usually just say, oh, you know, to lose a few pounds or I want to take my shirt off. And to get dive deeper, you ask them the follow up three questions. And the next question would be, well, can you tell me more about that? And that's just basically a question that you're trying to drag the rest of the why out. Can you tell me more about that? The third question is, well, why is that important to you? So after they tell you a little bit more about that, you've got to ask them, well, why is that important to you? And they're going to dig a little bit deeper into that why. And then this is the, this is the end question. And this is the one that you will know whether or not you have their why or not. Is you ask them, well, how does that make you feel? So if you have like a very, you know, skin deep, oh, oh, I want to take my shirt off. Well, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I want to look good at the beach. Um, you know, why is that important to you? Well, because there's people there, um, you know, and how does that make you feel? Okay, good. You know, if you get one sentence or like one word answers, you know, you're not digging deep enough. And so then you would start back, well, why? Why is it important to you to take your shirt off? And you're going to dig deeper and deeper and deeper until you get to that point where it's pretty emotional. And when you ask them, well, how does that make you feel? If it's something that's very personal to them, you're, you're going to realize that you've actually hit their why. And that's what you need to do. Just continue practicing these four questions when you're asking and talking to people, uh, you know, when you're talking to potential challengers, when you're talking to coaches, um, you know, new coaches, you're trying to get to know them. Those are some, those are the four questions that I will generally ask people to find out what their deep, dark why is. So with that in, in place, now, why are you guys here? Well, in reality, all you guys in the group, I think there's like 96 people. Basically what you did is you raised your hand and you said, Hey guys, I want to be a leader. I want to be a active participant in this group. And I want to become a diamond coach. Now as a diamond coach, you need to have at least 12 coaches under you, right? Well, that makes you a leader. So basically you're telling us the Beachbody community team engage. Hey everybody, I want to be a leader. I want people to follow me. I want to inspire people. Um, and so you're going to notice that things are going to start to shift for you because you're moving towards more of a leadership role. And that means 
Um, it's not just all about your success club now. It's not just all about your personal development. It's not all about your rank advancement. It's about the rank advancement and, and the success club of the people that you have on your team because you are becoming a leader. Now you still need to do those things because you know you need to you need to be the front runner when it comes to being a leader. And leaders don't uh, you know run from the back. They they actually start up front. But you've also got to be focused on your team because you are the leader of that team. So it probably sounds familiar, you know, when it comes to being a leader, when it comes to uh, um, this coaching opportunity, because you did the same thing when you transitioned from a customer to a coach because before when you were a customer it was all about your results right it wasn't about well like how many people can i help and how can i share meal plans with people and how can i run these free groups it wasn't about that it was all about you 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 and you were like well how can i eat better and it was just you know solely focused on you and then you became a leader when you became a coach and then you started helping out your challengers and now you're saying hey i want to become a diamond coach and now that means you're shifting again you're shifting towards helping your current coaches because once you make diamond coach you're not going to get anywhere unless you help other people make it to diamond, right? And so that is the big thing is we're here, you know, to kind of understand leadership, but then also we're here to be the in the front, you know, inspiring and motivating people to continue to do what we've done. And I know that that can kind of be overwhelming and we can kind of get a little bit nervous when we hear um, it's time for us to be a leader. But like I said, from the first time that somebody followed in your footsteps when you told them hey you know what this program worked for me or shakeology worked for me and they fell in line behind you they joined you they drank their shakeology they did their workout and they felt great um, and you saw those changes you were a leader already whether or not you think you are you are because people are following behind you remember being a great leader is about influence it's it's basically getting people to follow you without using you know uh, specific rules or demanding that they do something they're doing it because they want to follow you not because of anything that you're, you've said to them and so um, you know you've been a leader before whether or not you think you are you're definitely a leader right now okay now leadership I want to I want to dive a little bit deeper into actual let's start off with the word leadership or leader I want to kind of explain to you what that means now um, now if you look up Webster's dictionary it basically says it's a person who rules, guides, or inspires others. So a person who rules, guides, or inspires others. So let me just take out the, the first person, a person who rules. So we all have people in our lives who are the leaders who rule, right? They have a bunch of rules and they tell you what to do. And when they're in front of you, you're like, oh, yes, sir, no, sir. But as soon as they turn their back, you're like, okay, I'm not following that person. Like there's no chance that I'm gonna do what that person told me, right? because they're just telling you what to do and they have a bunch of rules in place to make sure that you know you follow them but in reality your heart isn't in it the next kind of ruler or the leader would be somebody a person who guides you and we're looking you know somebody who guides you is definitely a big help it's a lot better um, as opposed to just a normal ruler right there's somebody who kind of guides you and goes well maybe you should go down this direction or hey I have some suggestions about this and so that's a little bit better of a leader but the kind of leaders that we want to be are the people who inspire others. Now, when you inspire people, they do things, instead of doing them for you, they're doing them for themselves. But you've inspired them, so they, they're following you, they believe in you, and they trust in you, and they will do the things that you want them to do, but not for the reason that you think. It's not because they want to you know, do them for you, it's because they wanna do them for themselves. It's because you've inspired them, you've inspired this why, you've inspired this vision in them, and they wanna do it on their own. So one of the most important characteristics of this leader, of this inspiring leader, is that you've got to think of other people first, right? And I know we talk about this all the time, right? If you help enough people achieve their goals, then what? You know, you can achieve any, any of yours, right? And that's the same thing as being a leader. You've got to put other people ahead of you. And not just like say that you're going to do it, but actually through your actions, you have to show people that you're going to be there to help them. Now, Abraham Lincoln said something, and Abraham Lincoln was, a, was an amazing personal development guy, but um, what he, uh, one of these lines that he said was, if you would win a man to your cause, first convince him that you are his sincere friend. So let me say that again. If you could win a man to your cause, first convince him that you are his sincere friend. So it's about relationships, right? And so that's what he's talking about. He's talking about you want to 
um, form a relationship, an authentic relationship where you actually care about other people first and they will follow you anywhere, right? They'll follow you into battle, right? That's a huge thing. Okay, now you're gonna hear me talk a, a little bit about John C. Maxwell because he has taught me a lot that I know about leadership um, and he has some pretty amazing books that you guys wanna, might wanna take a look at. But um, when John Maxwell talks about leadership, he talks about the same kind of thing. He says, you got to connect with people on a personal level first. People buy into the leader or they buy into you first before they buy into your vision or before they buy into a, their why or anything like that. They have to buy into you first. They've got to really um, get that feeling that you're in there to do, uh, you know, to, to really help them out. You're not just in there just telling and giving people directions like you're in there. Um, you're, you're a leader, but you're not going to hurt them. You, you have their interests as number one that's in and that is an important part of being a leader because they must buy into you first before they buy into any vision that you have now when people consider when people are thinking about following a leader and you're you're, you're kind of wondering well whether or not you should follow this person there's really three questions that you ask yourself you may not know if you're asking yourself this but you already know the answers to these things um, but these are the three questions that john c maxwell says that you're really asking yourself internally whether or not you're gonna follow this leader. Number one is, does he or she care for me? Like, does this leader really care for me? Number two is, can this leader actually help me? Number three is, can I trust him or her? So number one is, does he or she care for me? Number two is, can he or she help me? And number three is, can I trust them? So if you can honestly say yes to all three of those, those, that's going to be a leader that you're going to want to follow. In reverse, now that you are the leader, you've got, to, you've got to be looking at these questions and thinking, well, if that person were to ask that of me, would they think that I care about them? Would they think that, they could, uh, um, that I could help them? And would they think that, that I could be trusted by them? Very important things, because if you, don't, if you don't hit those key points, they're not going to buy into you as a leader, and they're not going to, they're not going to be able to um, you know, buy into your vision, which we'll go over in a few minutes. Now, John C. Maxwell says, if you, uh, leaders must touch a heart before they can ask for a hand. So before you bring somebody along with you in the journey, you've actually got to touch their heart. You've got to um, uh, kind of, not necessarily bond, but you've got to have a, a positive relationship with that person before you ask for them to start following you. Let's see. And then obviously the most important thing is you must align your words and your deeds displaying consistency over time before you can earn the authority to be followed. So just saying that, you know, Hey guys, everybody here, I love you so much. And you're just so amazing. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to help you. Like, unless you're actually, you know, following through and your actions are kind of showing that to people, people aren't going to follow you. People aren't going to get in line to get behind you. You're not going to inspire people. Um, and, and that's something that you're just going to be out on a walk, right? You know, you heard that, that saying where if you go on, you know, if you think you're the leader and you turn around and there's nobody behind you, you're just going out on a walk, right? Well, that's because you haven't inspired people. People don't trust you. Um, people don't think that you have their best interests in mind. Okay. Now, now that we're done all this mushy stuff about relationships, right? Um, I want you to know that just because you have a relationship doesn't magically make you a leader of somebody, right? Um, leaders must still give an informed, clear, and compelling vision, basically a direction that they want people to follow to actually be a leader. Because we have people in our lives who are, you know, they're, they're, they're great. We have good relationships with them, but we wouldn't follow them anywhere. Um, you know, it's, they, don't, they don't have a clear vision of where they're going. And I can tell you, um, this actually happened to me. We had a lieutenant who is, and I'm a police officer, by the way, so we had a, um, a little mini riot in LA and we had this Lieutenant who he really takes care of everybody. He's a great guy. Well, when he got out there, I was a Sergeant in charge of my pl platoon and there was uh, four other um, platoons with me. He just got out there and he didn't have any clear vision. He had no idea what to do. He basically stood around and looked around and we were all like, well, what are we going to do? And that kind of puts everybody, everybody started else to crumble. So I had to step up and we had to, um, I had to start giving people direction as far as where we're headed. Hey, this is what we're doing. This is what our goals are. This is how we're going to do it. And then he started to feel a little bit better about it. But if you don't have that vision of where you want everybody to go, you're not just a leader. You're just out there. You know, you're just helping people and, and they've got that good feeling about you, but they're not going to follow you places because you don't have a clear vision. All right. So 
Simon Sinek, I'm sure you guys have actually, you actually heard this story when he was talking about it. Um, this is what he says um, a true leader is. There was um, a battle that was going on in Iraq and there was a group of soldiers that were walking from point A to point B. Well, when they were walking from point A to point B, they got attacked. Um, part of the soldiers were able to make it across. The other part were kind of pinned down. And one soldier got up from his uh, position of safety, went back and started to pull people over one at a time, back over to point B to help people. Um, so that way they didn't get stranded and they didn't get killed. Well, when they asked the soldier, hey, well, why is it you did that? Why is it that you were in a place of safety, but yet you went over there to help grab people, to help save people and bring them back with you? And this is generally what people who, who do these kind of heroic acts say. They say, well, they would have done the same thing for me. And that is what's important. That's the kind of leader that you want to be. You want to be that kind of leader where you will, you know, you're, you're, the people that are um, following you, that you're inspiring, they would do the same thing for you because they realize that you would do the same for them. That is whether or not you'll find out whether or not you're a, uh, um, you're a true leader, or at least other people think that you're a true leader. Okay, so we need this vision, right? How do you create? Well, actually, let me, let me first go over this. Just like with the whys, you know, you have your personal why and everybody has a different why, right? And then you have the why of the, the you know, of Team Beachbody. Well, we also have the same thing with the vision. So you guys went over visions with, uh, with Greg and Jason. And basically it's a tangible, you can see it, you can smell it, you can taste it. And it's your specific vision. It's not going to make, you know, if, if Michelle did her vision, it's not going to make Ashley want to work the business harder by looking at Michelle's vision. Everybody has their own personal vision, but we also have a vision as team Beachbody. So I want to go into a little bit about what I think Carl's why and Carl's vision is, because I don't know if you, you guys realize like how amazing of a CEO we have, how amazing of a business and company we have here. But as you dive deeper into this why, into this vision, you're going to kind of realize it. So Carl's why um, his why is he wants to rid United States and now Canada of obesity, right? He wants to, um, you know, make, make sure people live longer and more fulfilling lives, right? Now, do you think, and here's a question for you. If you were a multi-million dollar CEO and you had Beachbody, you had just the infomercials, but you were making millions and millions of dollars, would you feel satisfied? Like, would you say, you know what, that is my why. My why is just to be financially free and I'm just going to make millions of dollars. I'm happy. I have enough money and stop. You know, I can say that probably a lot of us would, but his why is deeper than that. His why said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay people to help out other people, make sure that they get through their program. They have the support they need. And you know what? They're going to pay the same exact price for the products. And then I'm going to in turn pay those people for helping. So if you think about that, like on a business standpoint, like you would be like, what are you crazy? Like, you know, I don't know what John Congdon said when, when Carl came up with this idea, but I mean, basically he's taking money away from his pocket and giving it to somebody else because he really does truly want to help people fulfill their goals. He wants them to become, um, you know, to, for us to leave this obesity epidemic in the, in the past. And so something like that, having a CEO that wants to do that and who has created that, this, this coaching opportunity for us is just really amazing. And that just shows you his why and how deep your why is, is whether or not you're going to give up and whether or not he was just going to say, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm a millionaire. You know, I'm, I'm happy with where I am, but he wasn't happy with where he was. So let's talk about his vision. Now, you probably have heard this because in, in the past couple of um, calls that he's done, he kind of talks about his vision. But his vision, what he can foresee, and I can actually see this too, is, you know, you have two guys, they're walking down the street, they, they haven't seen each other in a long time. And they're like, Hey, John, what's going on? Hey, who's your beach body coach? And he's like, Oh, it's, uh, you know, Mike. And, and so he's like, Oh, really? Because my coach is Greg. Like, Carl says that he wants everybody on the planet to have a beach body coach. That is his vision. He can foresee it people walking down the street and just talking to each other about who's your coach, who's your coach. And I don't know about you guys, I could see that I could see that that could potentially happen. I mean, he already has 300,000 of us out here, right? One man with one idea, with his why, has 300,000 people 
a lot of us are on this call, right? Not 75, but hey, Robert Hudgens can give me a run for my money. But still, one man can make that determination. And we have 300,000 coaches plus going, going, going based off of this vision and off his why. So that's why it's important that we have, number one, we buy into the leader, which I don't know about you guys. I really buy into Carl. I like the way he talks. I like that, you know, his actions follow what his words say. And if you probably have had a couple coaches who have fallen off or haven't gotten into this or um, they've had some problems with coach relations, so they decide they want to quit, like they haven't bought into the leader. They haven't bought into Carl. And that's like the main thing because I can tell you guys, like if, if I've had some problems with coach relations recently, but it has never crossed my mind that I should, you know, leave or do anything else because I buy into the reasoning why we're doing this. We're doing this is much bigger than just, you know, a, a petty thing that happens. Right. And so that's why the vision, the vision that a leader creates is, is so important. Okay. So how do people like Carl um, inspire people with this vision? There's four things that he does and I'm going to kind of break it down for you because I think it's important that you understand it so you can start breaking it down as well. First off, a great leader is a person who creates an inspiring vision of the future. So when you hear him talk, you can hear that he's creating this vision um, that he wants us all to follow, not for him, but for ourselves, right? Second thing is the great leader is a person who motivates and in inspires people to engage with the vision. So if you don't think that he's motivating us every single time he talks, I mean, Hearing him, is he's just a huge motiv motivational speaker, but you've got to inspire people to follow. Not just motivate, but you've also got to inspire them. A great leader is a person who manage the, manages the delivery of the vision by holding themselves and the team accountable. Now, this is a huge one. So basically, managing delivery just means he, he continues to remind us of why we're doing this, because sometimes we can lose track, right? Sometimes you'll lose track of your why, your vision, because something will happen, you'll get upset, you'll have a bad day, and you'll kind of lose track and you have to get zeroed back in. And so the leader has to make sure that you are doing that and your team is also doing that as well. But you've gotta be holding yourself and others accountable. Now, let me tell you an example of, of holding yourself accountable because Carl does this all the time. So when he, we had like the 21 day fix meltdown, I don't know how many of you guys have been a coach for a couple of years, but we had this huge meltdown where we didn't have enough stuff. Like he didn't realize that, that the 21 day fix was gonna be blown up out of proportion. And what he could have done is like every other CEO and just kind of ignored it and just let it like pass. But no, he came right out and said, listen, guys, I screwed up and I promised you that that will never happen again because his vision is bigger than that. And so he gave us some explanation as to what happened, what he was going to do next time. And have we had a repeat of the 21 day fix? Anybody? We have not because he has taken that upon himself. He took responsibility for it as a leader and we've moved forward from here. So that's an important one. So you not only have to hold other people accountable and say, hey, how many success club points do you have? But you have to be asking the same questions of yourself. Okay, the last one that Carl, um, Carl does is a great leader is a person who coaches and builds a team so that it is more effective at achieving a unified vision rather than it is separate. And basically he is inspiring people that they wanna be something bigger than just themselves. They don't wanna just be a coach by themselves. They want to create this entire coach network of like I said, 300,000 people to all build together as a team. And that's why we're all, you know, everything's duplicatable. We're all getting on these calls. Like everybody in this group, I think there's, I maybe have two coaches out of this whole entire 96, you know, coach group, but it's, I, I'm very passionate about helping by explaining all these different topics on leadership because I want to continue with this vision. I mean, my goal is to help Carl, to help myself, to help out every single person on this call do this. And it's not just because, um, you know, I think it's going to further me along. It's because I want to do the best that I can for you guys. And that's why I'm here. You, but just like that, I want to be a, um, I want to be something bigger than just myself too. That's why I um, buy into the vision. Okay. Let me take you into back into Simon Sinek talking about vision because I want to, I, I like to differentiate the two because he has a great story. And this is about the masonry, uh, the mason story. So you're walking down the street and you see two guys, they're doing the same exact thing. They're both laying bricks. All right. They're both laying bricks on the ground. So you walk up to the first one and you say, excuse me, sir, like what are, what is it you're doing? And the person looks at you and says, well, you know what? 
it's 100 degrees outside. These bricks are really heavy. I'm building uh, this wall. It may never be done by the time my lifetime is, you know, is over with. Um, you know, I hardly get paid enough, but you know what? I guess it's paying the bills. It just, I got to do this. So kind of leave me alone. I'm, I'm just building a wall. So the guy says, well, oh, okay. Thanks. Thank you very much for your time. He walks over to the next guy doing the same exact job and says, excuse me, sir, you know, what is it you're doing? And the guy looks up at him and he says, you know what? I am building a cathedral. He's like, this may never be done in my lifetime. I work in 100 degree weather and you know, it, the, the pay is not really that great, but listen, I am building a cathedral. This is gonna be the most beautiful thing. People are gonna come from thousands of miles away to see what it is that I'm doing, to see every single piece of brick that I'm putting in here. And he's like, I just feel great about it. So what's the difference between those two? It's their vision, right? Somebody sees themselves as being a bricklayer or a wall builder, and somebody sees themselves as being a cathedral builder, right? Now, do you think that if somebody came along and offered the bricklayer a few more dollars, like he would leave and, and just go do whatever it is that they told him to? Absolutely, because he doesn't have a clear vision. But I can tell you, if you go over to the cathedral builder and you try to give him a few more dollars an hour to do what he's doing, you know what? His, his work is far too important to take a few more extra dollars for that because he believes in the vision. He is building a cathedral. He's not just building a wall. And that is a huge um, story that Simon Sinek uh, really connected with me to um, because he's just, I mean, it's just the, the pure um, vision that you have is, the, is such an important part in your mindset, you know, whether or not you're in there and buying into it or not. Okay. So let me review real quick. So being a great leader is about caring for people first, right? They buy into you first. Being a great leader means you inspire and influence people to follow your vision, and that's when they buy into your vision second. But how do you create a vision, and how do you create the vision for your teammates? Now, that we kind of went over earlier, like how you create a why, and you, know, you can ask yourselves those questions. You can ask you know, your challengers and your coaches, but I want you to, um, I, I want to kind of break down how you create a vision, and this was actually something that Robert Hudgens taught us. Um, in our racehorse team that we had, right, Lisa? So he told us that we should ask a few different questions, okay? Um, now, when, when you think about vision, it's kind, of, it's kind of easy just to think about material things, but I want you to kind of not necessarily just think of material things. You can think of relationships. You can think of, you know, anything that you can touch, taste, smell, hear, anything like that. Don't just think about material things. But I want you to start by number one, creating and writing out a vision as if money was not an issue. So you wanna create a vision, don't worry about money, don't worry about what it's gonna to take to get there, don't worry about what it's gonna to take to you know, form your relationships with those people that you wanna be with again, don't worry about that, just write down what your vision would look like if money was not an issue. The second thing is, think of what it's going to feel when you actually accomplish that vision. So once you write this all down, um, look at it and say, you know what, what is it exactly that it's going to take to accomplish it? The third part is you want to print out your vision, whether you have pictures, whether you have an address of a home, whether you have a relationship, um, you know, you have a specific relationship, you want to take out their picture, um, you know, of somebody that you want to be with, whatever, and post it near your workstation. It's got to be something that you see. It's a vision. You've got to be able to see it on a constant basis. Remember, we've got to continue to remind ourselves of it. Number four, and this is a hard one, is share your vision with other people. And that means like people on your team. It means people in this group, but it also means like your personally sponsored coaches and your other team group. You've got to get out there and you've got to share it. Well, why? Well, number one, you've got to hold yourself accountable by sharing that, right? But number two, you've got to show them that it's, it, it, your vision can be and should be about you and what you see. Because you want your teammates to create a vision too. And you don't want them to feel all icky that you know their vision is going to you know, mean that they're going to have to make a ton of money. Like money is an important thing, but it's just the means to get to your vision, right? So don't feel like you can't make this about you. It's got to be about you. It's your why. It's your vision. And by putting it out there and saying, this is my vision, you're going to make people feel a lot more comfortable about it. You know, I mean, like Greg posting the other day about his 500,000, like putting that out there is just like, wow, like it's, it's out there. He is now holding all of us accountable to beating that. But like we would have never known if he hadn't put it out there. It's the same with the vision. And I'm sure it was difficult for Jason or for him to post it out there, but you've got to post it out there because it, it means a lot to everybody else. Number five, 
And this is the most important thing. After you've created your vision, you've written it out, you posted it out, you wrote it on your team wall. Number five is take action. We don't progress without action. Like you can have this amazing picture on the wall. And I actually have a, a picture of a Tesla over here because uh, I want this blue Tesla. But you can have this great picture and then never do anything for it. And it's just going to be a picture on the wall. Or you can actually get out there and just start taking action, do what it takes to get there. And when you look up, um, when you look up on the wall every single day and see that, you see your why. I actually have my vision written out um, and I have it there too. Thanks, Teresa. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's that important to me. I can just look at it and I can remind myself, you know what? That person told me no today. Boo hoo, cry about it. I can cry about it for five minutes and then I can look up at my board and say, well, this is what I'm working for. And so it's important to number five, take action. Now, when you can imagine it, and this is why a vision is important, when you can imagine it, when you can feel it, when you can smell it, when you can taste it, for some reason, the world gives into your vision. It allows your vision to come into reality. I don't know what it is. It probably has something to do with your subconscious mind. Like things start to happen. People start saying yes. Coaches start joining your team. People start you know, getting out there and really being able to help people. And people start taking your advice. But you've got to have that vision of where you want to be or you have no idea where you're going to go, right? Okay. So I know this has been a little long, but I'm going to give you a homework assignment, okay, guys? And this is where we're going to end it. And then I'll uh, see if you guys have any questions for me or Teresa. But I want you guys to do this for your homework assignment. Number one is, I want you to complete your vision. So if you've done it already, go back and fine tune it. Look into, and I mean very specific, like if you have an address for where you wanna live, put the address. Um, include photographs. Photographs are very important, not just words. Get photographs, get you know pictures of the beach if you're gonna do it. Like Greg's has, has a great one because he has all these pictures of where he's gonna live and the house and all that. Like that's what you want. You want it to be something that you can see, not just words. Print it out, put it on your workstation, share it with your team. And here's the last part, have them do the same too. Like it's great if you have a vision and that's gonna get you motivated and get you really inspired and you're gonna follow along with the leader, with Carl, but you need to inspire other people on your team. So you need to do this training with them. Remember, you're a leader now. So these things that you're learning in the group about the why, about your vision, it is now your responsibility to go back to your people and to talk to them about their why and to talk to them about their vision and have them do these things and pass it on because I can't talk to everybody, but you guys definitely can multiply that, right? So definitely go out there, do those things for you and then do those for your team as well. The last thing I want you to do, this is kind of an easy and it's a hard thing, is I want you to rate your leadership. Based off of what we talked about, about you know people buying to a leader first, I want you to take an honest look at your leadership. Are you leading from the front? Do you care about people? Do people think you care about them? You may think it, but you're maybe not, you know, you're maybe not connecting with people that way. Do you think people trust you? Do you think people would follow you? Or are you influencing and inspire people? I want you to rate yourself on one to 10 and let us know what you think, what part you think you can need to work on. I mean, is there a specific part of there that you really want to work on? Because I want you to post that in our group. Don't worry about posting that into you know, your, your personal page or anything like that, but post it into our group. I wanna hear what you guys think. And there should not be anything below a six in this group because you guys are all here. You guys have all had a tremendous success with Beachbody. You've had, you have coaches under you. You're taking the time and the energy and the effort to listen to these calls. You know, I've been a talking head for 40 minutes and you guys have been sitting here staring at me. So you guys are leaders and I don't want to see any ones or twos, okay? And Lisa, you're like an 11, so I better see that. But everybody else, write down what you think, rank one to 10, what your leadership is, um, and let me know what you think you could work on. Because I can tell you, I think I'm maybe like a six or a seven and there's some things that I'm going to work on and I'll post those in the group for you guys. But I want us all to share, okay? Um, and I think besides that, Greg, I think we're pretty much done. Unless anybody has any questions about this or even questions on the time management thing? Uh, one thing I was thinking, Mark, is, yeah, you're probably right. Not everybody knows you and your story and you are an inspirational leader. And, you know, just, just remind people, tell people your story, which I should have had you do in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, you didn't start out a great leader, like right in the beginning, right? I mean, you're, I know you, you're kind of an introverted guy. So how, how did you, you know, what was your story with Beachbody and how did you become such an inspirational leader? 
Okay. Hey, thank, well, thank, first off, thank you very much for, for saying that I'm an inspirational leader. But um, so my journey actually started off with P90X and my coach, Jason Wagner, um, we're both police officers together. Um, so uh, I really needed something besides the gym that I was just kind of circling around. And so I did that. I did P90X. I saw some great results. I just jumped into coaching. I, I really felt like, you know, coaching was my call and I enjoyed helping people, but it was a very much a rough start. Um, like Greg says, I'm, I'm an introvert. Like I feel better when I'm in the comfort of my own home and I don't have 76 people staring at me and listening to every word that I'm saying. But when I first started off, I was kind of in, very much intimidated by that. So what did I do? I ran from it. I didn't, I did not get in front of people. I did not create videos. I was like, create videos. What are you crazy? Like, I don't want people to see me on the, um, you know, on the video webinar or anything like that. I was just petrified of it. And it wasn't until I started to just embrace that. Like I started to just fail by doing videos. And um, it's funny because maybe about three or four months ago, I went back and I looked at some of my videos and my videos looked like I was shot in the dark and like all you could see were my teeth because like I did not know what I was doing, but I was failing so miserably that I was learning from it. And so that was a big deal with me. So I didn't start off fast. Um, it wasn't until I started getting in front of people and just, just saying, you know, what, it doesn't matter, you know, if I fail or if I do things wrong, because you know what, you're always going to learn from that. And then I continue learn and learn and learn. And then my, my, my thing is I like to share it with people. So um, if you see me walking down the street, you're probably not going to have a conversation with me like this at first, you know, because I'm kind of, I'm definitely an introvert being a police officer too. I'm kind of shy and I'm not shy, but I'm kind of guarded because I think everybody's out to get me. Um, you know, that's just the way that, that police officers have to act when we're on duty. Um, but, but, you know, I, it, it kind of started to come and start, you know, after I started to talk to more people and they started to, uh, um, you know, tell me that I was doing better things and, and I started to create videos and I started to inspire people and people started to get behind me. And, and then I started to have coaches come up to me and, 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 you know, not necessarily my personally sponsored coaches, but they wanted to get on the phone with me and they wanted to see other videos. I mean, it, it kind of, I think everybody kind of lifted me up. And so I think the big thing is the whole failure thing. Like, you're going to be nervous about the stuff you do. You're going to be nervous, like talking to your waiter about Beachbody. You're going to be nervous about, you know, talking to your family and to your friends. And for me, police officers, like if you think like people are rough to their partners, like try being a police officer and, and doing a size video in front of a camera and then posting that on the internet, because you cannot believe how many people have already completely humiliated me in roll call because of that. But you know what? I could care less at this point because, you know, I'm changing people's lives and there's those one or two people who are going to do it. And you know what? I'm just me. I'm just failing forward. And, you know, I'll pick myself up and, and, and keep walking forward. But I mean, I, I think that humiliation kind of did help me actually, because now I'm kind of like uh, immune to it. But um, so that's pretty much my story. Now I'm a three-star diamond. Um, I have my amazing wife here, Teresa. Um, so we are both. And the reason why we got asked to talk about uh, time management is because like time management is what we do. I mean, we have two kids. Um, we have to have a grandma come over today to watch them downstairs because normally we kind of switch off and Teresa will go on half the Zoom call and I'll go on half. Um, we have a four-year-old, a six-year-old. I have my busy career, right, Mike? I, I'm sure Mike can tell you what being a police officer is like going to court and all that stuff. Teresa has a full-time job. She's basically 12-hour days, five days a week. And so we have so many things going on. And then people are like, well, Beachbody will never work. Well, I'm a three-star diamond. She's a diamond. We make time, both of us. So some days it's her time. Some days it's my time. And you've just got to make the time, right? Because it doesn't just come to you. You actually have to go down there and drill down and, and put it in your schedule and make sure it's concrete and eliminate all the other noise. And that's where we're at. So I hope that kind of helped you out, Greg. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So uh, who has questions for Mark? Crickets, my favorite time. Uh, it just takes one question, then they, then they open up. Hi. Hello. Um, okay, so we, we talk about relationships, building the relationships. And I guess I have it stuck in my head that it takes so long to build a relationship with somebody, especially when you don't know them. And they want, you know, we want them to follow us on our Facebook and they have to get to know, you know, how we post, how we act and if it's consistent. And it just seems like it takes, you know, so long for that relationship to be built. But yet, you know, people on this call even and then just people like pages I read of different coaches, like 
they're just doing stuff like left and right, like, you know, getting coaches like five in a day or whatever. And I'm just like, how, how are, you know, it's in my head that these relationships take forever to be built when you don't have already like a following. So like, how, do, how does it all just fall into place, I guess? Okay, so let me do this. Um, I actually have a form that I usually uh, I, I send out to my coaches, and it's basically a group of questions that I ask people that I'm just meeting for the first time, kind of go to go through the relationship. And yes, sometimes it takes me 20 minutes. Sometimes it takes me weeks. It depends on that person. But <clears throat> I will post that up in our group just so you have an idea. But let me tell you this. When you're, when you're coming into contact with people, um, and this could be people who you don't know, like what is it that you have in – um, what, I mean, what do you have that, that is, um, what's the word? What do you have that's very similar to the, what they have? So let me give an example. Like people call it a niche or target market. So I help out police officers. I help out police officers and firefighters. So I get on the phone to somebody random on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast. So I'm in California. I get into a phone call with somebody from Alabama or somebody on, you know, further East than me. And I have never talked to them before, but I have, um, so much in common with them already because they're a part of my target market that if I talk to them for five minutes about police officers and responding to calls and filing, you know, cases and stuff like that, like it's like we're long lost brothers. Right. So there's something that you generally will have in common with people. And it could be that it could be, you know, the mother thing. It could be, you know, you just had twins. It could be, um, you know, whatever that is that you find yourself. I mean, it could be you live next door to them. I mean, it, whatever it is, that you guys sort of have that relationship started, that's the important thing to kind of build on. So when I talk to somebody on the phone and I spend five minutes, even before I get into like forming anybody or any of, any of those acronyms, and I just ask them like, oh, hey, you know, what does you do for work? Okay, how many hours do you work? Okay, these are the hours that I, like, like because we already have that commonality, we already feel like the relationship's there. And then I start going into that list that I'll post later of the questions that I ask just to get to know them a little better. And then I kind of share at the end my story. And at the end of a 20 to 25 minute call, a complete stranger joins my challenge group. Because I, you know, and here's the thing, like you can't compare your chapter four with my chapter 30. So I've been doing this for three, three and a half years now. And so I've talked to literally thousands of people and I've gotten this down kind of to a science to, to, to be able to form relationships with people like that on the phone but it's not going to be like that for you. It might take you 45 minutes or an hour right now. And it might take you a few times of failing of asking the wrong questions and stuff like that. Um, but I would suggest number one, just be yourself. Number two, figure out what it is that you're kind of connected with them for in the first place and start out there. Um, if they have kids and you have kids, boom, you know, if they're in a certain field and you're in a certain field, you're perfect. Or you live in the same places, you know, talk to them about different food places that are around where you live. I mean, you're connected there already. And so they've got that good relationship started. And then you start, um, you know, talking to them more and, and getting them involved in your challenge groups. And then you have that time in between them when they become a challenger, when they become a coach, you have that time to really do the fine tuning of the relationship. So does that make sense, Amber? Yes, it does. Okay. And I'll, I'll post that up. Um, I usually post that up in, uh, in, on my team page, but I have no problem sharing that with you guys. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, what about Teresa? Do you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, come over here. She's going to come over. Oh. Hi. Hello. So, you know what? I wanted to add on to um, that question about relationship. So, um, I think it also depends on what your intent is. So when you're thinking about forming a relationship with someone, you got to ask yourself, are you forming a relationship because you want to sell them a challenge pack? Or do you want to form a relationship because you want to eventually get someone to become a coach? So, I mean, you're going to be forming relationships and you're going to be building on relationships for the long, for the long term. So, you know, when you're, um, when you have someone that, um, you know, is interested in buying a program, it's not that you have to build that relationship to sell them the challenge pack or get them into your challenge group. You have, you're, you're trying to build that relationship because obviously that's not, 
it's not like a destination. It's something that's going to be building, um, you know, for the future. So it's kind of what your intent is. So, you know, maybe, and you can't compare yourself to the other coaches that, you know, have, do get all of those, um, those coaches like to just join right away. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's different. So, um, yeah, I think it's all about, you know, what, what it is that you, um, your intent is. That's it. So Teresa, how do you work a 12 hour day, five days a week with kids and do this business? Um, it's the, the whole time management thing. I mean, I have to be really strict about it and I'll kind of tell you how my day goes just so you can kind of understand how crazy I am. So I wake up at about 3.30 in the morning to work out because that is the only time that I'm able to do it. And, um, you know, I, I don't go to bed like at midnight and then wake up at 3.30. Um, I try to go to bed at least by 7.30. It's already so past like, your bedtime, like, isn't it? Yeah, I know. It's past my bedtime. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to go right to sleep when we hang up. Uh, no, but so yeah, I wake up at that time to work out. Then I get ready and I go to work. I have a really long commute. So um, I do kind of work on Beachbody at work um, and I'll, I'll try to do it, you know, during my lunch. Um, so I kind of schedule in some time there. It's not a lot. It's mostly just to kind of check in on the, on the groups because I don't want to be um, out of the group for too long. Um, I don't want to just, you know, post in the, in the middle of the night really for some people um, or, you know, all the way until the evening. So um, I do kind of try to check in during the day. And then, you know, when I come home, everything's done. Dinner is done. The kids kind of have all their homework done. Um, then I will kind of tag team with Mark. So Mark has some days that he has like his power hours. So he has like Tuesdays and what is it? Tuesdays and Thursdays and like Saturday mornings. And then I'll have Wednesday nights and Friday nights and then Sunday morning. So, I mean, we have to do it that way. That's the only way we can get it done. So we really try to stick to the schedule. I mean, it's not always perfect. You know, we have to kind of, um, you know, um, play by ear sometimes, but, but most of the time we just, we really stick to that schedule. Cool. So does anybody have any questions for Teresa? No? All right. Well, um, unless there's any other final questions, we will wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Mark, wherever, wherever you went. Right here. All right. <laughs> Um, we appreciate your, with what you did this week and for the call and everything you guys do for our team. You guys are great. Oh, thank you. No, thank you guys very much for showing up here. I know it's, uh, it's, what is it? 10 o'clock on the East coast. It's seven o'clock here. It's Sunday. You guys all have families and whatnot, but I mean, just showing up for this call and actually just sitting here in front of, you know, watching us. And I mean, that, that just shows where you guys are, you know, where your intentions are. I mean, you're, you're going to do fantastic in this business because you're not letting the excuses that everybody else who is not a part of this group, everybody else who just decided they couldn't make it, you're not going to let that hold you guys back. So I, I appreciate you guys all being here and putting forth all your effort. And that's, this is what makes us want to come out here and, and teach and help everybody is because you guys show up every day. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys.